Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, and this is our Tuesday afternoon episode. First, we're going to be crossing to Singapore. Paul Hadji, the CEO and founder of Haranji Cybersecurity, uh, and we're going to be looking at the working from home and uh, a recent finding that they made. Uh, but everyone's been finding this as well: increased cybersecurity risks for uh, particularly Southeast Asia, with him being in Singapore. Uh, due to misconfigured cloud infrastructure. So it'd uh, be good to get across what haranji has been doing. Uh, they've been around for about six years, so uh, plenty to tell there. Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, th thanks, Chris, for having me. Look looking forward to, to having a chat today. Good man, thank you. Um, it's a great background. It's the first comment I actually made, uh, and uh, I now know in Korean, harangi means tiger, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, that's that's why I have all these tigers around me. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, it's it's always nice to see, a, particularly speaking to a co-founder, obviously, of a, a cybersecurity startup, and particularly one that's obviously put some thought into your branding and being the tiger. Uh, I know if Shemaine Tan uh, was watching, uh, we published her book and we chose the tiger as a cover, given the type of beast it is, uh, yeah. rather than a lion. Maybe talk us into Harangi, where your um, your roots came from and then around the brand and, and what you've been trying to achieve over the last six years? Yeah, I think like uh, originally we started the company, um, I was actually uh, still working at Grab as the CISO there. Um, and we were doing it as a consulting business first. Um, but our first customer was actually training uh, incident response techniques to the Korean government um, through a program they call Best of the Best, uh, which is essentially ah. a, a school school for graduates <laughs> that um, uh, are interested in cybersecurity and, and go through like a long training course. So. That's kind of like where we got started um, uh, and we're talking with them about uh, starting a company and, and subsequently decided to name it Harangi because of course in Asia, uh, tigers are uh, the protector and uh, very fitting for a security company as well with uh, tiger teams and all this stuff. Um, Correct. So uh, decided to, to name it Harangi. And obviously they have a bit of a stealth capacity too. Uh, you do a bit of red, ta uh, red teaming uh, and the like. Where, where did you where did you actually make a start? Uh, you've got a, a SaaS platform, I believe, and we'll move into sort of the cloud infrastructure and configuration, but you've built this up over time. Where did you start? Because I think it's always a good story, even from Australian startups perspective and any startup. Uh, how did you go about it? Did you have partners as, as, as well? Yeah, so uh, myself and the the other co-founder Lee, who's um, also a, a very um, successful cybersecurity um, uh, expert in himself. Um, uh, essentially, we started the idea around like when I was at Grab, trying to find a vendor that understood the cloud uh, and cloud security. Uh, I couldn't find one in the region, um, so I ended up having to get one to help me from the U.S. Yeah. Um, and saw that as an opportunity to build a business around solving that problem. Uh, we started out as a services business. Uh, we still have a, a, a large uh, part of our business is services. Um, essentially because uh, of two things. One, uh, we want to get close to the problem and understand what is the right thing to build. And we built yeah. a couple of things before finally uh, sort of settling on the, the cloud security platform. Uh, and two, um, you know, uh, ultimately uh, most of the big security companies actually start out uh, as um, a services business because it's a, a very important way to build your brand uh, and kind of work with uh, large organizations to, to build a business. Um, of course, that made it difficult in terms of raising capital along the way because uh, generally the venture capitalists don't like uh, services businesses as much, <laughs> yes. um, but uh, is what it is. And, um, you know, we, we managed to fight through it and raise venture capital anyways. So you started services and then you're obviously identifying what the customers were looking for. Did you have a customer or client work with you along the way that you were working with? I think that's often uh, it leads to best success, isn't it? When you've got a, a customer that's prepared to back you a little bit and that you try, try out different things. Did you build the platform with a, a customer along on the journey? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, Gojek um, has been our customer since basically day one. Um, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're one of the bigger um, uh, sort of, well, they are one of the biggest uh, uh, tech yeah. unicorns in the region. So I've um, been working with them very closely for, for uh, about five years now. Um, and, um, yeah, very much helped us drive uh, sort of the decisions we made around the product. Been a user of both our product and services for, for quite a long time as well. And a great nice. partner in that. With, with the backers of uh, uh, Gojek, isn't it? Gojek? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The backers, were, were they investing in you as well? Did you find that the invest there's a commonality there with the investors? 
Yeah, eventually uh, some of the investors did uh, invest right. in us, but uh, it wasn't always the case. Um, definitely had them as a customer before we had any real investors. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, was, uh, we got them as a customer before uh, taking money from uh, other investors that invested in them. Yeah, and you obviously knew the sector quite well, but coming from Grab as well. So you knew what the requirements were uh, and, you, yeah, you just need someone to, that you could grow with, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, before that, I was at uh, Palantir as well and spent quite a bit of time there working on both intelligence and uh, cybersecurity problems. So I had, had the background and sort of uh, experience already. Uh, and then it was more about, um, you know, working on the business problems that, that uh, both companies faced and uh, helping them solve the security side of things. Yeah, well, look, maybe let's uh, talk about the, the release that came out. I hadn't heard of Harangi until I, I got this. And this was a, a release that came out. Uh, working from home could increase cybersecurity risks for Southeast Asian organizations due to misconfigured cloud infrastructure. Um, and maybe this comes down to also, you've recently been inducted uh, by Singapore's Infocom Media Development Authority or the IMDA uh, into the accreditation at SGD program, which I understand is a little bit like our IRAP program uh, where yes. you don't get accredited, I think you get assessed. So slightly, maybe slightly different. Um, yeah, maybe talk us into the cloud infrastructure and what you're finding around misconfigurations. Uh, and, and, and at what level are you finding it? Is it uh, sort of network level or how applications uh, are rolled out as well? Yeah, I think um, so. We are a cloud security platform, and one of the main areas we focus is on cloud security posture management, which is a, a Gartner category that we're uh, listed in. Um, but essentially, what that means is we're looking at all the configurations of the cloud infrastructure that we're integrated with. Um, and uh, seeing uh, what kind of maps to best practices in terms of security. Uh, and that, that's not only what we think is best practices, that's also like global and regional compliance standards. So in Singapore's case, uh, we have MASTRM, uh, which is the Monetary uh, Regulation Authority here, um, and um, you know, uh, help companies kind of uh, make sure that they're in compliance with uh, the regulations that uh, MAS has. Same thing in Indonesia. Uh, we also have APRA for Australia as yeah. well as uh, HKMA for uh, Hong Kong. Um, so I think from that aspect, we're really looking at the, the configurations in terms of making sure two-factor authentication is able, uh, making sure uh, S3 buckets are encrypted, um, if it's storing sensitive data, uh, those types of things. Um, and there's over 400 uh, rules now uh, that basically is run in their infrastructure to understand uh, whether they're uh, compliant with security practices or not. Uh, we also provide a vulnerability management layer, right, which allow the, allows them to sort of um, say whether things are false positive, false negative, or saying uh, uh, whether those risks are accepted, uh, for example, um, because of course there are some reasons why you would want uh, certain things to be in place, even if it looks like a misconfiguration from a security standpoint. Um, so yeah, really focused on on that layer. Um, and with the identity and access management side of things, uh, looking more at the users and ensuring that users have uh, sort of a, a least privilege uh, in terms of their access to the cloud infrastructure um, and making sure like key rotation and things like that uh, is happening as well. What, it, this is a SaaS platform, so they have to uh, sort, sort of sign up to this. It's not like an agent going out. This is a set of rules that are they ticking off uh, or is it automated as well? How, how does it actually work? Because as you say, what, 400 odd rules? Uh, <laughs> my head's dizzy already I, with people with a real job having to make sure that they match all of that. What's the, what's the, the platform? What's the sort of the secret source there? Yeah, so um, basically we take a read-only IAM role into their cloud infrastructure. So uh, we work, um, it's already integrated with uh, AWS, GCP, and Azure, and Ali Cloud, and Ali Cloud will launch um, this quarter. Um, uh, but essentially what we're doing is looking at the configurations against a rule set and providing uh, uh, the pass and fails in the UI for the user toolkit. Uh, right. We also have a feature that was released uh, uh, earlier this year called one-click remediation. So uh, for your case of like, oh, hey, I need to fix this, it's a lot of stuff to fix. There's actually a button where you can just like run a Lambda function or um, a coordinated function in the other uh, cloud service providers uh, and fix the issue. Um, uh, so I think from that aspect, uh, you know, we do make it quite easy for the, the users and whoever has access to the cloud infrastructure management uh, to fix the issues, yeah. um, as well as uh, actually, um, you know, maybe they, they don't feel comfortable sort of giving uh, uh, permissions to do that. Uh, we give the directions on how to do it. So step-by-step -step instructions, either through uh, the UI or through uh, the CLI and giving it like Terraform code snippets for them to, to uh, integrate into their um, uh, platform to, to fix the issues. So as you say, it's read only. So you, you're kind of just taking what their architecture is and then maybe going, you run a scan over that in terms of are they complying with certain, and I take it there's the platforms themselves, 
they're aligned with this. They have APIs for this now that allow you to build those tools to match uh, from a compliance and, and governance perspective. Yep, yep. Uh, we're actually just using a you know a security audit account uh, in most of those yep. cases to to do this. Um, and I think a lot of the value comes from making it easy to solve these issues and keeping on top of it, right? Because like you, know, you can run a scan anytime, but uh, you know running it uh, every day or anytime there's a change made in our case, um, uh, and notifying the organization via Slack or email that a change has been made that maybe security issue you should look at it. Uh, yeah. It's quite important and important in terms of the, the process of uh, them sort of keeping uh, secure and fixing things in a, a, a meaningful time frame. Um, so we kind of yeah. enable them to do that uh, as well as track it all. Um, so there's historical records of uh, you know what's happened, who's done uh, the change, uh, so it can be fixed, um, which allows the organization to improve uh, in terms of uh, their security posture or, uh, over time. Um, yep. And are you working? Yeah, are you working with MSPs or are you tend to work directly with the client? I think it depends on the size of the business. Um, and, you know, some organizations do choose to use MSSPs and, and we have uh, a lot of uh, MSSP partners um, that, right. that uh, use our product to secure their customer's cloud infrastructure um, and the MSSP ends up being our customer. Um, but a lot of times we go direct as well. I think it really depends on the maturity and sort of like what yep. industry they're in as well. So if you're a FinTech, generally they're gonna manage it themselves. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're in a, a less uh, sort of um, regulated industry, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll use an MSSP. Yeah. So you, 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 the question was, you've got MSPs within your portfolio, in other words, yeah? Um, yes, now, you mentioned pre-interview, you've got about 100 staff, 70 there in Singapore. Uh, how, how quick has that, has that growth been? Uh, and maybe that'll be sort of a good uh, insight into the cybersecurity landscape there in Singapore. We hear a lot about skills uh, and a demand on skills. So it sounds like business has been healthy. Have that been a sort of a, a, a consistent degree of growth for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think COVID was, uh, uh, last year, COVID was difficult for everyone and no one knew kind of yep. how it would affect the industry. Um, ultimately, you know, we weren't as affected as we thought. So in 2020, we were about 65 people. Um, uh, 2021, we grew. Uh, about 50% uh, already. Nice. Um, so I think that's been a, a good sign and somewhat reflective of how uh, resilient our business was during COVID. Um, uh, 2019, I think we were a little bit less than 50 people in uh, 2018, I think wow. around, around 20. And so pretty rapid growth, um, uh, but not the, the type of growth that you'd see in a, a B2C business for sure, um, but rapid for B2B. <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, and I, well, that was a bit of a question there in terms of is the growth coming from your platform and the, the SaaS, because obviously that's great growth because that's, uh, you know, that's what the business is obviously seem to be designed for, or is it more on your services side uh, with the likes of, you know, working from home and they need to do, you know, uh, pen testing and, and a bit more accreditation uh on that side, yeah, which, which side of the growth is, is there uh, in terms of what the clients are needing? Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to, to 2021 um, uh, because it, otherwise it gets a bit complicated. But um, <laughs> in 2021, both businesses are growing. Um, services is, is growing at a, a quite a good rate. Um, the product is growing significantly faster, and but from a lower base because um, we did start the yeah. services business um, first. Um, and ultimately, like when you look at a services and product uh, business, like, you know, one is clearly more scalable in the long run you know, versus, of course, yeah. the, the product business. Um, so that one will uh, eventually outscale the services business. But uh, uh, we always feel and, and continue to sort of prove that the services side of the business is an important part of building a strong product company because of the research and development yeah. uh, um, efforts that are necessary and specifically in cybersecurity and, and really in all of technology, in my opinion. And again, from the services side, what kind of services are you finding uh, are they and you know, are you in what sort of uh, in industry verticals that you are kind of strongest in yeah so i think uh, regulated industries uh in uh, singapore's and, and really the region's case is always uh, going to be a focus because they're, they're required uh, to do things like penetration testing and compliance work um yeah. uh, but the tech industry as well even companies that aren't regulated are, are starting to feel pushback from consumers on uh, sort of investing in security and, and making a part of their branding and kind of uh, marketing efforts as well um, because more and more companies are starting to see like how serious it can be if uh, you know there's a large data loss and Singapore government has done a good job of kind of um, uh, you know communicating with these companies and talking about the fines that uh, you know the potential of fines that, that could be there if data is lost 
um, or if data is handled incorrectly. Uh, so I think the community is starting to take cybersecurity uh, much more seriously. And I've seen quite a bit of growth in the, the past I guess, eight or nine years that I've been here. You think the legislation's working now? Like they needed legislation to make cybersecurity uh, get up to that board level and then start to take it seriously? I think there's two things that drive cybersecurity like growth and sales is like regulation and fear. Uh, I think we're kind of in the middle of both of those. <laughs> All the fear um, of regulation. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's true as well. Like, I mean, in, in both cases, they, they really do drive cybersecurity spending. And I, I think ultimately makes the organizations and, and governments more secure. Um, because, uh, and right now, I think we're kind of in the timing of where, where both are kind of hitting, like the regulation is uh, becoming more pronounced, uh, people are talking about it more, there's more punishment in terms of the companies that uh, uh, you know, don't do their uh, sort of um, uh, requirements in terms of security. Uh, and then the fear is also happening because, you know, there's plenty of uh, breaches going on around the world and they're yeah. much more publicized than they were three to five years ago. Um, and Southeast Asia, uh, for you, you've obviously focused there in Singapore. You've mentioned Korea. You've got other other stuff in Korea. Uh, how how spread out are you across the ASEAN region? Yeah, I would say the majority of our workforce is in Singapore, uh, with Indonesia being the second big office, uh, the biggest right. office. Uh, and then we kind of have people spread around in different parts, like Hong Kong, Philippines, um, uh, and other in the US as well. Um, but uh, you know, I think we'll continue to grow that effort, especially as now we're, you know, kind of a remote company, regardless of uh, uh, where yeah. people are at. Um, so uh, I think that's a conceded effort for us is to, to really um, hire the best talent, uh, regardless of location w within uh, certain time zone restrictions. I think we'll, we will keep that yeah. in place. How, how is the Indonesian market? That's an interesting one. And I think uh, our Australian listeners uh, and audience will take interest in this because there's obviously Australian startups that look towards Singapore uh, from their product as well. Uh, so Singapore is a bit of a given, but uh, Indonesia, maybe Thailand, how, how do you find moving in? There, there can be difficult markets to get into, but once you're quite there, are you finding growth or how long have you been in, in Indonesia? We've been in Indonesia for basically ever since we, we started working with, with Gojek, Gojek, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, we've had a positive experience. I, I think, um, uh, you know, in our case, like we had like pretty much the best anchor client you could have going into that yeah. market. Uh, so that really helped. And anytime we enter to do market, I always recommend just, that you have an anchor everyone client. Everyone knows right? the brand, right? So yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, like uh, and, and my case as well, and, and how we kind of think about new markets is by finding an anchor client first. So someone that you can kind of use as the client to help you sort of um, uh, spread in either brand name or um, uh, sort of uh, reputation wise. Um, so in our case, it's been great. Um, uh, and it's a huge market for us and something that we will continue to invest in and grow. Um, what about yeah. skills and language uh, issues there? Much on skills? Um, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, skills and talent. I mean, definitely, um, you know, you have to do quite a bit of interviewing and finding the right people. But, um, you know, we've always been able to find the talent that, that we have. Our team is about 30 people. Um, so it's uh, scaled pretty big and not, not huge. Um, uh, but we're continuing to grow and continuing to, to hire there. Um, so I think the talent is there. Um, uh, there's some level of uh, language, but a major, like our whole team speaks English. Um, yeah. and some of that has been like on the job training um, in terms of getting it up to a certain level because of course the rest of the company is uh, speaking English. Um, but uh, in general, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's been, been quite good. And uh, normally I'm there every other week, but haven't been able to go for the past yeah. uh, year and a half. What a shame. But, um, um, and what about the, the maturity of the market? Because again, Southeast Asia, you look at the 10 nations of ASEAN, you know, you've got everything from uh, sort of Myanmar, although we found Cambodia, you know, growing quite quickly as well but uh yeah the maturity of across the market in comparison to singapore yeah I think from the Sing enterprise perspective yeah singapore is by far like the most mature um i think indonesia and thailand in my opinion are, are quite close um uh in the bigger companies i think once you kind of uh, go down from the the bigger companies it starts to deteriorate a bit but with the bigger companies and a lot of the tech companies, um, you know, because they're utilizing the cloud, and they're more forward, I think, on the security front, they are spending and they're also, um, you know, taking it quite seriously. Um, we see a lot of conceited, like, sort of interest in uh, solving their security problems. Um, 
but um you know like you do have other troubles there like you know procurement is quite different like a lot of cases you're doing business in their uh, local um, currency um language uh, some companies like won't do contracts in english things like that so yeah. like there is hurdles uh, don't don't get me wrong um but ultimately i think like the markets are worthwhile in entering um now if you're coming from australia there may be other markets you want, want to enter in first but um, you yeah. know, in Indonesia, it's 260 million people, so it's uh, you know much bigger than uh, Australia and uh, <laughs> almost as big as the U.S., right? So I, I think it's um, yeah. uh, you know it's quite a big market. It's growing extremely fast. Um, I think that um, uh, is is something that's important to, to get in earlier rather than later. I think yeah, I think you're spot on, and I also think we underestimate the sophistication up there as well. You know, again, the moment you started talking about Thailand, I think Bangkok. There's a lot of head offices in Bangkok for global companies uh, anyway, uh, and they uplift uh, everyone around them. Now, we had uh, promised to do uh, the misconfigured cloud infrastructure. We might get back on the topic. Sorry, business is always an interest to me. Um, what, what are the, the common uh, issues that you do find? Where do you think companies struggle from? Is, is it the uh, overlay of regulations and compliance as because, as you say, there's 400 sort of rules there. That that's a challenge for any uh, company, or is it just the speed of uh, sort of the transformation that they've been under to cloud? Uh, where do you think um, some of the the key misconfigurations are, and some of the sort of areas that uh, companies should be focusing on along their their sort of transformation? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, no different than the traditional environments, like, you know, patching is really one of the major problems, like when you're kind of running a tr more traditional uh, network and keeping all your systems up to date, you know, like the cloud service providers have taken care of a large portion of that. But, yeah. uh, you know, in doing that, there's a lot of configurations that you can make to customize your cloud infrastructure. And of course, like they need the freedom of making those configurations in a way where you can do almost anything you want. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and then like you have, let's say you have 30 developers uh, building an application in a tech company context or maybe, you know, 10 IT people managing this. It's a lot of people that can make mistakes uh, and miss uh, sort of misconfigurations uh, and going on. And like just like with like your traditional IT infrastructure environment, you have something that kind of ensures that all the patching uh, and configurations of the, the laptops and the images are, are done correctly. Um, it's kind of like what we're doing, but for the cloud infrastructure, it's just like it's different. Yeah. Thing we're looking at and we're looking at the configurations of how things are configured in the cloud of infrastructure um, so i think access is one of the biggest and most important things um, so making making sure that uh, people have the uh, you know least privilege access to what they need to have access to and not everything making sure when you're integrating third-party uh, products and services through apis or whatnot they have least privilege access as well um, uh, because a, a lot of breaches in the cloud have to do with like third-party vendors getting breached and then subsequently having too much access in someone else's cloud infrastructure, which can cause yeah. uh, quite, quite a bit of issues, as you can imagine. Um, and then really like um, just the basics in terms of, uh, you know, 30 people working in an environment, changing things on a day-to-day -day basis, someone's going to make a mistake. As much as you can teach people, uh, we will make mistakes and something needs to be monitoring that um, to sort of uh, ensure that the configurations, uh, you know, are, are being done correctly. And, and like our product allows you to customize it too. So if there's uh, certain uh, standards uh, you have internally, then you can kind of build those in or turn rules on and off uh, based upon your preferences. Um, and then, you know, you need that kind of loop of, okay, uh, we do these as best practices, but we need a check in place that's going to ensure that yeah. um, we don't, we make a mistake essentially uh, and then if we do make a mistake it alerts us uh, and we can quickly fix it uh, quickly identify and fix it um so i think for us um uh, identifying fixing and uh, complying uh, uh with the standards is really important and probably yeah. probably refixing too it's like we only fixed that last week why is that uh, sort of broken again or who opened that uh and uh i suppose that's the biggest thing isn't it you got to assume that there's a misconfiguration there somewhere uh, and it does become a full-time job hence why you're in business i take it is that uh, you never do an audit and never have a finding is that where you find you tend to come on with new clients you pretty much you still have to do an assessment uh you do a, a sense of a sort of a hygiene audit and then you apply your tools over the top of that to look at for future changes and and uh, rule changes yeah, so essentially uh, with our product, we do a two week free trial uh, and part of the installation process is, is basically doing the first scan uh, and yeah. then it gives them a report and we've never had anyone, uh, well, only two customers have not had a critical issue, um, okay. um, uh, which is like kind of uh, help them 
uh, identify that there's a need for this, uh, irregardless of how good we train our people and what we have in place. Um, uh, it's quite important to have something in place to do this. Um, and then like we have a trend line too. So what we want to see is kind of like the customers, okay, they install it, find security issues. And then over time, like they gradually are seeing less and less and the sort of time to fix is getting faster and faster. All right. And that's kind of like the metric that uh, any CISO is going to want to be able to report to their board is that like, yeah, of course issues happen, but when they happen, you know, we can fix them. And, you know, hopefully it's like 24 hours for critical issues, but uh, you know, depending on the organization and the size, like it, it may be different, uh, but we enable them to kind of track that stuff and uh, work within the organization to fix those problems and, and integrate with their developer and IT tools as well. Um, because yeah. that's really important uh, as well as to become part of the process, uh, not create a new one. Well, the, uh, the other thing is business is always changing. It's not like they're ever going to stay the same. Go, yep, we've got it right. That's it. We'll just stay it there. It, there's always something new going on. Uh, and uh, so, it, yeah, it's a good business to be in, I imagine. Um, look, Paul, we've uh, that's right on time, mate. And I, I, I've had probably about four or five other questions. So hopefully we'll be able to get you back uh, into the future. Uh, it has been an interesting time. Singapore, you're in restriction at the moment, but maybe not full lockdown uh, like us here in Sydney, but Melbourne's Adelaide's coming out. What's the current situation in Singapore? Yeah, we're in, um, they call it phase two, um, but right. essentially, um, you know, restaurants are closed. Um, uh, you're supposed to work from home, of course, um, but you can still go outside and go for runs and, um, and meet people in uh, groups of two. Um, but right. yeah, not many places to go, uh, considering all the, <laughs> the, the restaurants and, uh, um, uh, you know, casual places are, are closed, um, at least physically. But of course, there's takeout uh, available and you meet at each other's houses. And how long has that been going on for? Is that relatively new again? Yeah, I think they started it uh, just last Thursday, so about a right. week now, um, um, because there was some, some another small outbreak. But the vaccination rate is, is significantly high uh, high here. It's like 60% now, so I think uh, very okay. quickly we'll be back into somewhat of normalcy, uh, which is good. Beautiful. Well, fingers crossed for that. Well, look, uh, Paul Hadji, the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder with Harangi Cybersecurity there in Singapore. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I appreciate you joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly. Thanks, Chris. Have a good day. Good on you, mate.